folks, and good afternoon. My name is Rich Longo of Flycast Partners, and I'd like to thank you for joining us for another Flycast Partners presentation. Today, the topics on purchasing enterprise software presented by our very own Bobby McCullough. Now, Bobby has over two decades selling, implementing, and supporting a variety of solutions, including IT service, operations, financial management, <laughs> utilization management, IT asset management, infrastructure management, change management, expense management, integration, IT operations analytics. He has configured demonstration systems using JSON file ingestion through application API and Python, and has added value in multiple product engagements, providing overall solution views and clarity. His extensive experience in lean methodologies and proven record of designing and implementing more efficient and cost-effective procedures and technologies is invaluable. Before we get started, Bobby, let me introduce our organization. Flycast Partners is here to deliver a seriously amazing IT experience. We are founded in staff by personnel that have many years of experience in the IT space. We took the best ideas from these collective experiences and added the best components necessary to grow and become a leading value-added reseller in the North American IT market. We offer best-in-class implementation services and training in IT service management, IT asset management, IT operations management, enterprise service management, and workload automation spaces, all using ITIL best practice. Our professional service team can easily scale up or down to meet the needs of any organization, regardless of your size, complexity, or budgetary restrictions. We offer implementation services both on-site and remote, especially in the world we live in today. I know a lot of you only want it remote, uh, and which makes sense, as well as training to help reinforce your company's long-term IT success. Our ongoing remote administration services and support service offerings will enable you to focus on the normal day-to-day -day operations, saving you both precious time and money. I encourage you to give us a call at 844-FLYCAST, that's 844-359-2278, or visit our website and chat with one of our representatives that are there Monday through Friday during normal business hours. They can't wait to answer your questions or provide you with the material that you may be looking for. I encourage you to poke around on our website and look for data sheets, white papers, new technologies, tools, uh, what's out there today, our blogs, podcasts, numerous podcasts. I encourage you to also email us at info at Flycast Partners with any questions or, or comments that you may have. Throughout this presentation today, I, if you have any questions, go ahead and type those in the Q&A section of this GoToWebinar tool. And I will ask those to Bobby in the middle of the presentation on your behalf. Without further delay, I'm gonna turn this over to you, Bobby. Great, thanks, Rich. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as Rich stated, today we're gonna talk a bit about purchasing enterprise software. Now, my my background, you know, Rich already gave away uh, over two decades. I think the first 15 or so years of that was primarily working in uh, what's called Fed and SLED, uh, federal government, state and local government, uh, in higher education. And, and so most of those organizations uh, have a process, a defined process for purchasing enterprise software. If you're not in one of those entities, in one of those organizations, then uh, – that, that process process may be a little foreign to you, and so we kind of want to go through what that uh, what that process is, looks looks like, what you should expect, and, and and how you can be involved in it and get the most out of that process. So it's a little bit like catching fish. So if you were like me, and you know the first time you went fishing when you were a kid, uh, you, you just you put some bait on a hook and you dropped it in the water. Uh, it didn't matter where in the water you dropped it. It didn't matter what time of day it was. It didn't matter what type of bait you were using. Uh, that's just is how you did it. And but but as as you get older uh, and, and you meet other people that fish and, and actually have someone that might actually uh, know what's going on, you find out that uh, fishing is really a, an entire system of location, timing, and tools. And when you put the complete system together, when, you know, you deploy that complete system in search of fish, your chances of success are much, much greater. And, and, and that's a lot like choosing enterprise software. It, it involves a system as well. And uh, uh, the, the proper deployment of that system 
is going to ensure that you catch the software fish that you're looking for. So now why is enterprise grade software different? What, what makes it different from other software purchases? So enterprise software are going to be things that you've heard of, things like Oracle, PeopleSoft, NetSuite, SAP, Salesforce, and so on. Wikipedia defines it as computer software used to satisfy the needs of an organization rather than individuals. The difference here really is scope. Uh, enterprise grade software tools are utilized by more areas in an organization, are more visible in an organization, uh, either higher or broader or both. Uh, and, and scope is what requires a system, uh, really a system to require, uh, to acquire, uh, a software of this type. So since the tools and scope, uh, the tool scope can be so large, the decision is, is going to likely be a group one. And more to the point, it's going to be several groups are going to be involved in the decision. And, and you're going to have to understand those groups and, and help and, and try to navigate that. And we'll, we'll talk about that some as we, as we move through the deck here. So get to know your vendor and get to know the options that are out there. So the first thing, you know, uh, you, you want to do some investigation. You want to find out what's available to solve the problems that you're looking to solve. Uh, that's going to involve some communication with vendors. They're going to be eager to talk to you. Uh, uh, they're going to want to be friends. Uh, you, you want to allow them to do that. Uh, allow them to get to know you. You want to get to know them. Uh, but, but you also want to know what, what their offerings are, what's available in the marketplace, uh, so that you've got a way to sort of hone in on, on really what you can address with your problems. You know, you, you, you may find that you've got a problem you want to address, but there really isn't uh, any type of, of uh, sort of out-of-the-box type software solution for you. You're going to want to know that. You're going to want to know that going into, into the process. So, so get to know your vendor, get to know their options, and, and let them make friends with you. So how are you going to define requirements? when the requirements are coming from multiple multiple groups? Well, the best way to do this is a, a moderately democratic approach. Uh, that's really the only way you're gonna be able to ensure that a proper decision is, is made. Uh, so when you, you know, the first step is developing those requirements and you've got competing groups and, and, and that may be more difficult to, to, to arrive at those requirements than you think. Uh, each group needs to develop their own list of requirements, uh, and within each group, it's gonna, those requirements are going to require input from both management and staff from each of the groups. And then once those, uh, each group has developed their requirements, you're going to find that you've got repeat competing requirements. And uh, so those are going to have to be resolved some way. Obviously, the, the, the first way to resolve that is for the competing groups to discuss and maybe come to a, a decision on how to approach the issue, uh, which uh, requirement is going to be the one that the, the organization is going to go with. But it, it may actually come down that you have to find an arbiter, uh, someone to look at those requirements and, uh, and tell you which, ones, which one the company is going to go with. Uh, this part could uh, require, this, this part of the process could require input from uh, from the different vendors, so this is why it's it's uh, important uh, to get to know your vendors and their options uh, up front and early. And uh, uh, even though your your buying process may be a year long, uh, you know you're going to want to get some answers early to some of these questions. So in addition to that arbiter, you're probably going to want an overall project or solution consultant. Uh, uh, identified for your organization. The primary task is going to be to understand the overall requirements and help identify when there are competing uh, requirements between the groups. They may not always be so obvious. You know, different groups may have different uh, language, different terminology, and so it, it may not be as easy to understand when you've got uh, competing requirements. And uh, that would be this project or solution consultant's job to help to help identify those. Uh, <clears throat> you should also put a time limit uh, on the, the effort for identifying and, and uh, defining these requirements. You should bring in all stakeholders uh, for those requirements. 
but you, you know, you, you don't want to take forever. Uh, 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 you don't want to get into, uh, 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 analysis paralysis where nothing, nothing gets, gets done because you're just, just constantly analyzing. So you need to put a time limit on it. And, and everybody understands that at the end of that time limit, there, you know, we're, we're not going to extend it. Uh, this, these are the requirements we're going to go with, and this is our date for that. Now, within those requirements, one of the big questions you're going to have in today's uh, environment, uh, in, in today's economy, is whether or not you're going to go on-premise or SaaS. Now, obviously, sometimes the solutions may drive that. There are some solutions that are, that are only available as SaaS. Uh, others that maybe are only available as on premise, uh, but but you might want to identify which of these is really going to be your goal. Now your organizations, your your IT department may have an initiative. You know we're we're moving to the cloud, so we're going to go as much SaaS as possible. Uh, we're go uh, maybe they're they're trying to pull back from the cloud. You, you know that uh, the move to the cloud has been going on for a few years now, so. Uh, in certain places, certain ver industry verticals, there's a little movement back uh, to on-prem from the cloud. So you've got to decide which of those is, is going to be a priority for you, keeping in mind that, that those are sometimes uh, uh, limits from the solutions that might be provided. So what's the big difference between on-premise or SaaS? So for, for you guys, the, the folks that are attending this, this webinar today, for you it's mostly control. Uh, an on-premise solution gives you all the control of it. You control the boxes, the operating systems, uh, uh, which boxes the solution is installed on, how it's configured. It's all, all under your control and, 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 and in your area of management. <clears throat> uh, the, on the other side of that with SaaS is the ease of that. Uh, with a SaaS solution, you, you don't have to control the machines, the environment that it's installed on. You don't have to control or manage the operating systems uh, or the actual uh, installation and, ma and uh, management of the, uh, the initial solution. The, all of that is handled on the back end for you from the, uh, from the SaaS vendor. Now, between the two, there's, a, there's definitely a cost difference. Uh, usually, uh, on-premise is more expensive up front, and, and SaaS tends to be more expensive over time uh, because it's, you know, SaaS, you're paying for uh, the, the management of the boxes or the environments on the back end and, uh, and the upgrades and everything that have to occur. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's really which of those is going to be best for your organization. Uh, it probably doesn't involve you, but I'm sure it involves your managers. Uh, the, the, there's a different way that these two types of solutions are paid for. Generally speaking, an on-premise solution is uh, paid for from a capital budget, capital expenditure, and, and that's because it's, it's going to be amortized over time and, and, and so on. A SaaS solution tends to be purchased with operating budget. Uh, operating capital. So the, the, a couple of ways to look at that, you know, what's going to be best for you guys in, in managing the system and what's going to be best for your organization from a, a cost perspective uh, and a budgeting perspective. So you're going you're gonna to have to make those decisions. So timing. Everybody knows that, that timing is everything. So several years ago, I'll give you a little aside here. Several years ago, I uh, uh, had an uncle we, we traced our, our ancestry back to Scotland, and uh, they bugged me to get a kilt. I, I waited until my daughter got a little older. I think I should have done that done that earlier. Uh, that that that's all about timing. If I had bought that uh, when she was uh, little, she would have probably thought it was cool, and uh, would be willing to take pictures without without bags over her head. So uh, timing is everything. And as I mentioned analysis paralysis earlier, it's easy to get, you know, into the process of thinking that every single I uh, must be dotted and every T crossed. But you need to keep in mind that there's going to be trade-offs between effort and output. You, you know, you don't need to get into that analysis paralysis. Uh, the, if, it's, if you determine maybe that the time frame set's not going to be adequate, uh, maybe your process should take a timeout 
and reset so expectations can be a little more realistic. Uh, you you want to get a good result from your from your choices, but you just don't want to take forever to get there. It shouldn't take forever uh, to get there. When you're defining those requirements, uh, there are several sources that you can use as a starting point. Uh, you know, industry or trade organizations uh, uh, usually have members in the in these areas that can help. Uh, one of the first areas they're going to recommend are going to be industry experts. And so early in your process, you're going to want to go seek out those industry experts, foresters and, and gardeners of the world. Uh, those are going to help you understand, you know, how, how long this process should take, how long you should expect this process to take, and, uh, uh, and, and help you really better define what that timing is. The, those industry experts have information and comparisons that are going to be invaluable. Just keep in mind, though, that those industry experts are in business and their primary purpose is to make money. Uh, so uh, you should just keep that in mind whenever you're using us. References. So you're going to, you're going to want specific references uh, around the solution. You're going to want to talk to people that match your industry and have requirements like yours. Uh, that's, it, that's very, very valuable. Uh, when uh, when making these choices. Now, sometimes because of the time constraints, uh, you can't necessarily talk to references early in the process. Uh, maybe once you've nailed down uh, or, 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 or narrowed down your choices to the top three, then that's when you go and talk to those references. You're going to have to determine when this works best in your process. Uh, but, but having a reference, if you can visit on site, is well worth the, the drive and maybe paying for a meal or two uh, to get that information. The, the, the insights gained from that resource are probably going to be more valuable than what you're going to get from industry experts. Uh, and this can become a resource for you uh, once you're in production. Uh, you've got a friend nearby uh, in your industry uh, 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 with your requirements uh, that you can talk to about how they're managing things as well. To RFX or not to RFX? So if you've been a part of a, uh, uh, a federal uh, uh, software purchase, uh, higher ed or government software purchase, you're probably familiar with the RFX process. Uh, uh, the, the RFX process, uh, in, in a nutshell, really breaks down to these three things, or four things. A request for information. So this is a, uh, you're looking what's out there. Uh, what's available, and uh, I, I'm trying to get you're trying to get an idea of uh, what options each vendor has uh, in the areas where you're trying to solve problems. Uh, and so this is just a request for information. It sort of makes an announcement that uh, that you're starting a formal process to procure something. Uh, this is the first stage, and so everyone knows that it may not go any farther. Uh, the, the the next stage or the next option would be a request for proposal, and this is where normally requirements are outlined. Uh, information gathered from an RFI uh, is sort of honed down into exactly the requirements that uh, that your that your organization needs, uh, and and a way to score those responses so that you can. Uh, that you can then to be, uh, make judgments about those, the different vendors that are uh, responding to that. So it's a little bit different purpose uh, with the RFP. Uh, still, an RFP does not ensure that there's that there uh, uh, there's going to be a purchase, uh, but uh, it's more likely that there's going to be a purchase uh, than if there's an RFI. A request for quote. Uh, this these are the things that we want to do. And we want to know what uh, it will cost with you uh, to do that. Uh, quote and bid, request for bid are much the same type of things. Uh, all of these really are just as their as their name is the uh, their name describes exactly what they're for. Uh, you may not use all of these processes, but just know that there are uh, uh, you can find lots of information out on the internet. Uh, about these different uh, uh, RFX options. And it, it, even if you're not doing a full bone process, you can bring in elements of these to your process 
uh, to help define things and maybe make it easier to score uh, what's going on uh, with those vendors. The, the bottom line is uh, document your requirements in a form uh, that can eas be easily transmitted to the appropriate parties. Uh, those requirements all uh, become a part of these RFXs, and, and so you, you're going to want to make that in a, in a format that's easily transferable. So where to from here? So, you know, we've talked about, uh, uh, you know, some of the issues you're going to encounter within your own organization uh, with competing uh, requirements, uh, to, you know, where to go about defining those requirements, uh, getting to know your, your, your vendor. Uh, maybe the RFX process to uh, to find out maybe which vendor is going to be the best for your solution. But ultimately, it may come down to either a proof of value or a proof of concept. And the, the main difference between these two is a proof of value is uh, a, uh, a somewhat configured system uh, that applies to your specific use cases. Uh, you define those use cases that you're going to use uh, that determine the value that the solution is going to provide. Uh, you should not expect those uh, those use cases once configured to be complete. Uh, they're just to give you an idea of what's possible in the solution. And normally, a proof of value does not have a cost associated with it. If, however, uh, you decide that you want a proof of concept, that requires more configuration and development from the uh, software vendor. So in, in that instance, you, you very likely are going to be paying uh, for some part of those activities. Now, maybe that uh, maybe you're not charged that unless you buy or something like that. There's, there's all of those kind of options. Uh, but normally with a proof of concept, the use cases are going to be uh, built out a little in a little more detail. Uh, you're going to see a little closer uh, to what you're going to see in your environment uh, through those proof of concepts. I hesitate to say you're going to see exactly what you would see in your environment because uh, it's not going, uh, generally that's, this is not something that's set up in your environment. Uh, depending on the tool, uh, there are some tools that proof of concept might be set up, uh, uh, but for a lot of them it's not. It's going to be in a separate environment. So you have to decide which of these you want to go with. Uh, not every organization does this. Uh, not a, not every, every organization goes to this detail. Uh, depends on what you're buying and uh, the, the, the nature of, you know, your requirements. If you've got, uh, if you're scoring vendors, you know, with an RFX and they're, uh, uh, they're able to respond yes, uh, to your requirements, uh, uh, yes, out of the box, then uh, maybe a proof of value or proof of concepts not not needed. But if most of the vendors respond to your requirements with uh, yes, with configuration or customization, then at that point you may want to see a little more of what's possible with the solution rather than just uh, just accepting what might be available out of the box. So each organization is going to have its own purchasing process. Uh, purchasing process. Uh, you're going to want to know what part you, you play in that process, uh, and the other players within your organization. Uh, uh, who are those players in that process? Those are the people you're going to interact with. Uh, vendors sometimes uh, may have their own selling process, but the best the best vendors are going to align their process to their selling process. To your buying process, and 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 you, you're you're going to want to look for that. That that that's something that's going to be key. Uh, starting out your engagement with a vendor, uh, if you can't get sales uh, to align their process with your buying process, then uh, th that's a tip off that that support may be a problem down the line. So an organized system of choosing enterprise class software is going to help you eliminate risks. It's going to help ensure that a best choice for your organization is made. And there's no guarantees that, you know, there's nothing that says uh, everything's going to be 100% uh, the way you need it. Uh, but following an outline like this, a defined process, understanding, uh, you know, what that process looks like, uh, 
that goes a long way to, to helping clear the murky water so that you're able to catch the fish that you want. So Rich, we're done a little early. I don't know if there were any questions up to this point. You know, I don't have any questions uh, up to this point. I don't see any questions, folks. If you have questions, go ahead and type those in. Uh, Bobby would be more than happy to answer them. Uh, if you uh, don't want to do it that way, well, you can always email us at info at flycastpartners.com or call us at 844-FLYCAST. That's 844-359-2278. I uh, appreciate your time uh, in joining us today, folks. I know everybody's busy. And Bobby, I definitely appreciate your time. I know you're a busy man. Thank you. No problem, Rich. Thank you. Folks, stay safe out there. And until our next presentation, we'll see you then.